Dhawan 2 engine. Right, this is a very interesting topic because uh, this is the first time a, a private space agency in India is going for 3D technology based, 3D printing based and uh, cryogenic engine. Now cryogenic engine in itself is a very difficult technology and going for that with the help of 3D printing technology is again a difficult task. So that is why this particular topic becomes very important. So what is this topic? In this a private space company which is named as Skyroot in India is going for 3D printed Dhawan 2 engine uh, which is based on the cryogenic, engine, cryogenic technology. All right, so the question basically arises is that what, why, what is the importance of cryogenic engine? What exactly is a cryogenic engine? Why 3D printing technology is used? What is 3D printing technology? And uh, who is funding this particular space agency? What is the importance of private participation in the Indian space agency? All these are the questions which are going to come up in our discussion. So now, first of all, uh, let us understand that uh, the entire mission of this particular company, Skyroot company, which is the Vikram rockets. So it has already launched uh, a Vikram S rocket, which is the sounding rocket, just to check uh, whether everything is working fine or not. Now, upcoming rockets are Vikram 1, Vikram 2 and Vikram 3. Now they are differ in the amount of weight that they can carry and the kind of engines that they are going to carry. So in Vikram 1 rocket, so now uh, first of all understand that this let's say is a rocket, alright. Now here there will be several engines, there will be several fuel stages, right. So Vikram 1 rocket is based on completely solid propulsion engine, alright. That is number one thing that we have to understand. But in the Vikram 2, this changes and here there will be solid stages, but the upper stage will be a cryogenic engine. Now, what is the meaning of upper stage? So let's say there are three stages, right? Stage number one, stage number two and stage number three in this particular rocket, right? So in Vikram 1, all three stages will be uh, solid based, right? But in Vikram 2, the upper stage, uh, the upper stage is responsible for finally putting the satellite into the orbit. So in the upper stage, uh, in Vikram 2, we are going to use the cryogenic engine. Alright, that is the most important point. In Vikram 3, the amount of weight that they are going to carry will increase and also they will start using these strap-on rocket engines so as to give us extra boost uh, during the initial launch. So that is a basic difference, right? So now let us understand uh, the uh, why Dhawan, what is the importance of Dhawan 1 and Dhawan 2 engine. So basically here we are reading about Dhawan 2 engine. We also had a Dhawan 1, uh, a Dhawan 1 uh, engine, a prototype, right? So in Dhawan 1 also we tried this cryogenic engine, but then it was not as powerful in uh, as the Dhawan 2 engine is going to be, alright? So here we are going to read about the Dhawan 2 engine. So Dhawan 2 engine is cryogenic engine, cryogenic engine, alright? So let us first of all understand what is a cryogenic engine or what are the various types of fuels which are available. So as I told you there are liquid fuels, solid fuels, cryogenic fuels and there are other fuels also which are uh, which are definitely used but let's say from the exam's perspective they're not very important. Alright, so solid fuels are those which at the room temperature or at normal temperature are in the solid state. Now even the cryogenic engine we have liquid fuels only but they are not liquid at the room temperature. But the liquid fuels, which are actual liquid fuels, they are actually liquid in the room temperature, right? So there are three types of fuels that we can study. They, these are being used in the rockets, right? So now let us ha have a look at what is a cryogenic engine, right? So let's understand this. So uh, as it's written in your recitals, it uses two high performance rocket propellants in which liquid natural gas and liquid oxygen will be used. So mind you, these are gases at room temperature, natural gas and oxygen, both are gases at room temperature. So to make them liquid, we need to reduce the temperature, right? So uh, now here it's written that liquid uh, na natural gas is formed when the temperature is minus 161.5 degrees Celsius, all right? So this is such a low temperature. And liquid oxygen is formed when the temperature goes below minus 183 degree Celsius. So that is how we create cryogenic engine. There are very, very cold temperatures have to be created to, to create such kind of fuels, right? 
so uh, and even only six countries uh, till today like us russia india only the six countries have you know as of now developed this particular technology of going for cryogenic engines all right so uh, the normal question arises what are the advantages of a cryogenic engine all right so as it's written in your recitals the cryogenic engine increases the payload carrying capacity of the rocket so you would see some uh, some words are highlighted uh, and those words are important in your recitals you can mark them you can learn them right but there are various other advantages of a cryogenic engine now when we have a cryogenic engine the efficiency of the fuel greatly increases as compared to the solid fuel these fuels have more density these fuels have more these fuels give more thrust and that is why they make the space missions less costly all right though there is cost with respect to the cryogenic engine but with respect to the entire thrusting cost it reduces right they have high energy density clean uh, pollution uh, pollution free uh, the cryogenic uh, fuels that we use are uh, giving out less pollution right as compared to the solid and the liquid fuels that we have right they are suitable for heavy lifting because they have huge amount of thrust they are more efficient that is why heavy rockets can be lifted with the help of cryogenic fuel right and what is this in situ resource utilization now see oxygen and hydrogen or maybe let's say natural gas right uh, in future oxygen and hydrogen even those can be used as uh, cryogenic uh, in, in the cryogenic engine so oxygen and hydrogen both are available in the atmosphere on its own right so in future we will be able to develop the technology right to directly convert the hydrogen and the oxygen which is there in the uh, atmosphere into liquid con uh, counterpart right and then we need not even carry the fuels from the earth right and that will greatly reduce the weight of the satellite and therefore more and more weight can be carried to the space right the efficiency of the entire space mission will improve all right so in the in that manner cryogenic fuels cryogenic engines have a huge responsibility have a huge uh, advantages all right so now let us look at what are the disadvantages of a cryogenic engine certainly there are they are more complex see maintaining temperatures like minus 163 minus 180 degree celsius is never easy india has developed the technology and we really you know it's it has done a commendable job but then maintaining this temperature throughout the journey of the satellite it's not an easy task right so it's very complex it becomes definitely expensive because it requires a lot of technology will it not become expensive isn't it right it is very sensitive to temperature as well now uh, as we saw that liquid oxygen will be liquid at a very low temperature minus 180 degree celsius all right so to maintain that particular temperature it becomes very sensitive as soon as the temperature rises right it will convert into gases right and that will reduce the efficiency of the fuel so it's very sensitive to temperature and since it's liquid a leakage is definitely possible so all these are the challenges that the cryogenic engine faces uh, when they are introduced in a space uh, satellite all right so now the question arises the another word which was there that it is 3d printing now what is 3d printing i am sure that you would understand that but let's revise this concept so in 3d printing as in this very simple diagram you can see this particular object is a 3d object but how is it built it is built layer by layer so in 3d printing we built a particular object in layers now how do we do that there are various phases of this particular thing right first is the design phase so there are various softwares like cad in which the entire solid structure the entire 3d structure is being designed howsoever we want the building to look like howsoever we want the uh, rockets to look like all these are designed designed in the uh, software now in that particular software we do this slicing so layer by layer layer by layer we see at this particular level this is to be designed at this particular level this is to be designed so we will divide this particular thing into layers right like this and this data layer by layer data will be fed into the printer so the printer will be set up with the help of these layer by layer data now the printer will print or you know it will deposit the material layer by layer so whatever kind of material it is let's say it's a, it can be a concrete it can be aluminum it can be plastic whatever we want to uh, put into into that it will be deposited layer by layer 
all right that is there then the printing process will be there and then the post processing what is done in the post processing so let's say there are some sharp edges we need to we need to make them uh, smooth there are some rough edges all right so some kind of finishing touch has to be given and then we will do the testing and the verification and the 3d printing job will be done so just a small introduction about what is 3d printing and how 3d printing is being done you simply have to remember it's a additive manufacturing technology what is it additive so whenever in mains you are going to write the definition you have to mention this particular word additive manufacturing technology all right that is what 3d printing is and it will print the print or it will build anything based on layers all right now let us have a look we have understood whatever technologies are involved in this particular vikram rocket in the dhawan rocket now let us have a look at what are the advantages of this particular vikram rocket so first of all it's the first space agency private space agency in india which is going for developing the launch vehicles this in itself is a very important achievement from the india's perspective right so it's a first privately developed launch vehicle now the other thing is that it will help in launching small satellites into the atmosphere into the space right so and and remember small satellites like cube sats nano sats mini sats are becoming very very important in these days because you know they are very efficient they can be uh, assembled in a very short time they can be sent in a very short time and quick experiments can be made in the space so small satellite market is really booming in this particular era so in the in that perspective this particular technology and this particular firm skyroot and and its vikram rocket will become very important right so now it can carry scientific experiments into into the space to study about earth to study about sun moon various planets right and do various experiments that can be done and india will move ahead with that right various space based services for example telecommunication uh, disaster management earth observation weather forecasting all these can be done with the help of these rockets right and new space technologies new uh, testing technologies research technologies all these will be built as a consequence of promotion of private participation in the in the indian space agency in the uh, space sector right so now let us have a look as we talked about small satellite and low earth orbits right uh, this particular uh, vikram rocket is going to launch satellites small satellites into the low earth orbit so let's uh, understand the concept of various orbits which are there right so low uh, as i told you before low earth orbit orbit is there medium earth orbit is there geostationary orbits are there geosynchronous orbits are there sun synchronous orbits are there and there are also uh, similar uh, to this a polar orbit orbit one more thing is that which is polar orbit let's have a understanding about these right so low earth orbit as i told you before they are till the less than 2000 kilometers right so when we launch satellites below 2000 km it will be considered as low earth orbit small satellites are launched in that right and it is very important for the uh, earth observation satellites right then we have a uh, medium earth orbit so this will be from 2000 to guess the number uh, what is the number for the geostationary and the geosynchronous orbits right so from 2000 to 35786 something like that right kilometer so till this uh, particular level they will be known as medium earth orbit right they are used for multiple purposes right now geostationary and geosynchronous orbits are kind of related right what is the difference i hope you would know that so geostationary let's say we have a earth over here and that is the equator all right so if the satellite is launched such that it will stay above the equator only right so the uh, whatever the orbit is there of the particular satellite it will stay above the equator only right it's synced with the equator so in that case and the timing and what is the uh, what is the height of this particular these particular uh, orbits both these this is exactly as 35786 kilometer so at this particular height uh the rotation time of the satellite or you know the time in which uh, the satellite covers one revolution is same uh, the time in which earth completes one rotation all right so in 24 hours the satellite is going to revolve across the entire earth so uh, with that you know when it's above the equator itself you would see that the satellite is uh, fixed at a particular time because earth is moving this way and even the satellite is moving with uh, with the earth itself right so uh, in the 24 hours earth is going to complete the entire round in the 24 hours satellite is also going to complete the entire round right so in that sense you will see that the satellite is stationary that is why it is known as geostationary orbit all right then what is geosynchronous 
So geosynchronous one difference is that now with respect to equator, the inclination of geostationary satellites is zero degree, right? Because they are exactly above the equator. But with respect to geosynchronous orbit, the inclination can be anything. It won't be zero, deg zero degree, right? So it can be like this, it can be like this, right? So it can be any inclination. So though they will also complete the entire, uh, you know, revolution around the earth in 24 hours only, 24 hours only, but they will not look stationary because, you know, earth is moving in this particular direction and the satellite is moving like this. So they won't, they won't look stationary. But what a special thing is going to happen? Now, every time, see, let's say, let's say the earth is completing one round in 24 hours, right? So this particular point, right? Uh, it goes there, uh, that's the point on earth, right? It goes there, come back in 24 hours at this particular point. Let's say we have a satellite which is in this particular direction. All right, it also goes through, um, goes above this particular point, right? So even this satellite is going to cover uh, the entire duration, entire uh, revolution, uh, rotation around the Earth in 24 hours. So after 24 hours, these two points are again going to meet at the same time, right? So this is the this is the special thing that you know uh, whatever point it goes through throughout the Earth, it will always reach that point at the same time every day. So that is the simple difference between geostationary and the geosynchronous orbits, all right? Now comes the sun synchronous and the polar orbits. So they are very close, they are very close to each other because in the sun synchronous orbit and the polar orbit, both are almost aligned to the poles. So here we are going for uh, uh, equator, right, east to west. Here we are going for, in the polar synchronous orbit, we are going for north pole to the south pole, right? So polar orbit are very important for the Earth observation satellites. Right, and sun synchronous satellites will be those, they are very close, they are almost to the polar orbit, but they will be synced with the direction of the, or you know, timing of the sun. So let's say the time is 9 p.m. at this particular, at this, it will be like this. So the time is, let's say 9 p.m. at this particular point. So every day at 9 p.m., right, this particular satellite is going to come at that particular position. So it's related to sun timing, the local timing, whatever local timing is over there. Right, it will reach that particular point at that particular time only. So that is the uh, difference between uh, these particular satellites. All right. So th it is very important to understand these difference because in the examination you might be asked things related to these particular orbits. All right. So as I told you regarding small satellites, let us have let us understand what is the difference and uh, you know uh, what is the weight level. So whenever the satellites are less than five hundred kgs. All right they are known as small satellites, right? And uh, you know, there are several examples uh, of small satellites like CubeSats are there, mini satellites are there, micro satellites are there. So they all depend based on the weight. Now here is your homework. You need to find out the various categorization of the small satellites and write down in your notes, right? So from one kilogram to 10 kilogram, what it is called, from 10 kilogram to let's say 50 kilogram, what it is called. So all those categorizations you have to find out as the homework. So that is about the small satellites. Now, uh, since we are reading about satellites, it, it becomes very important to understand the Indian space industry. All right. So uh, in the mains examination, you might have to write some data uh, in your answers. All right. So you, just a few data we can uh, mention over here that only 2% India in India, only 2% of the economy is the space economy. That is very less when compared to the other developed countries. All right. But we can see that India is the sixth largest player in the space industry internationally. Right. So ISRO is having huge achievements these days. Right. The Chandrayaan 3 mission is there. Aditya L1 mission is there. And there are so many uh, missions, successful missions, which ISRO has launched. So Indian space industry is rapidly moving forward. Right. 3.6% of the world's space tech companies are there in India. We will definitely catch up in the coming years. Right. And US is there, which holds the leaders spot with more than 56.4% uh, of all the companies in the space technology. There are just a few data which might spice up the answer which you write in the mains examination. All right. So what all you need to read more, what are the homework that you have to do when you read about uh, these particular topics? 
So see, uh, whenever you read a particular topic, you need to read it comprehensively, isn't it? So when you're reading space technology or any topic related to space, let us finish up everything. So uh, when you're reading this particular topic, you have to read about the in-space mission, the in-space uh, organization which is there, the new Space India Limited organization which is there, India Space Association which is there, uh, Indian Space Policy of 2023 which is, uh, which is over there. So about all these, you have to read just five important points and write down in your notes. Thank you.